Okay, I think I have started the recording again. All right, so I'm going to get started. I want to welcome everyone to Environmental Fridays. It is personal. I believe everyone has seen my um, slide here, my PowerPoint. Yes. Okay. Um, we, you guys can view the entire schedule and speaker's bio, either using the link here at the bottom, or you could use the QR code to get to our website and read more about each speaker and the schedule, upcoming schedule. So today um, we have two co-hosts. Um, well, before I, I say that, before I go to that, um, upcoming for this uh, month is one um, presentation next week. Today, we are going to hear from Megan on the effect of air pollution on child brain development. And then to close off uh, Fe February, we'll hear from Sonia Gupta. Um, I believe she's a student at Harvard University, and she will speak to us on the impact of the environment on human health. So my two guests, uh, co-hosts today, <clears throat> uh, Aaliyah Paris and Susan Wolford White. So Aaliyah is a biology student in Trinidad. So Aaliyah, tell us a little bit what does COSTAT stand for? So we have an uh, idea of what that abbreviation stands for. College of Science Technology, I think. The AA, I believe, is Applied Arts. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, of Trinidad and Tobago, right? And Tobago, yes. Okay. Um, so tell tell us to um, something interesting about yourself that you're passionate about. <laughs> well, I would say my passions are within the sciences, um, and I plan on making that my entire field. Right now, I work at work somewhere called Clever Solutions Limited, and we deal with different laboratories throughout the Caribbean. Um, so when I try going into different jobs, I stick to what is in the scientific field so I can expand my knowledge. Okay. What yeah. Something that was curious to me when I read your bio and your interest is that you want to get into the field of neuroscience. Yes, I do. Interesting that you are <laughs> Yeah, introducing a behavioral neuroscientist. Yes, I'm not sure if I'm more excited or nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll yes. even the score. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a hookup. You, you <laughs> yeah. see what I mean? That's right. Come on so over. Let's go have up. some coffee. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm feeling. I'm really honored. To be introducing her. Yes, so you will do that a little bit later here. Then yes. Susan, a longtime friend from like way back when. <laughs> Susan, can you tell us a little bit about your interest, pastime, whatever? Hi, good morning, morning. Uh, Dr. Murray. Good to see you again and everyone else. Um, let's see, what am I passionate about? About children's health, about starting out with healthy lifestyles as early as possible, even before they enter the world in many cases, um, so that they can carry that health through their lives and live out their full purpose. Good, good, good. Thank you so very much. So we'll be hearing more from Susan during the Q&A session. Again, maybe there might be a collaboration in the offering between you and Megan, who knows? Absolutely. Her work is so fascinating. Yes, yes. 
So, um, I want to introduce um, another friend within the last year, I guess, we got to know each other. Some really cool pictures I in store for you guys. Lisa Sorensen is executive director of Birds Caribbean, and so she will give us for the next 10 minutes or so um, a little insight into what she does. We will be having her coming back fall of 2024 to give us a longer version, but this is just a taste and a tease. Lisa? I'll stop sharing and you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is delightful to get to meet some other people that are in various fields, all doing great work, obviously. Yes. All right. So let me get my presentation started. Uh, Okay, I hope you can all see this. We are, we are, it's good. Yeah, so so yeah, um, I'm just happy to be here to tell you a little bit about my organization and the work that we do. Um, how, how many of you even heard of Birds Caribbean? If you're not in the world of birds and in the Caribbean, <laughs> then probably maybe not. So yeah, um, I work for a regional nonprofit called Birds Caribbean. And um, we're dedicated to the conservation of Caribbean birds and their habitats throughout all the islands. And this includes the Bahamas, Greater Antilles, Lesser Antilles, and, and even um, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, Trinidad, Tobago, because although these islands are ornithologically more connected to South America than the West Indies, um, since they are islands, they face the same conservation challenges as all the other islands in the region. So... So our mission is to um, raise awareness, promote sound science, and empower our local partners to build a region where people appreciate, conserve, and benefit from thriving bird populations and ecosystems. So some of you might know that the Caribbean is actually um, known as a hotspot for biodiversity conservation. And it's one of the top five areas on the planet for biodiversity in terms of the number of endemic species for the land area and the threat of an extinction for this for these species. There's so there's over 700 species of birds, and of these are 180 are endemic, meaning that they're found only in the West Indies and nowhere else in the world. So some islands have um, single island endemics, and you know anywhere from like 18 to 34. This includes the bigger islands like Jamaica. Cuba, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico. And then the Lesser Antilles also and Bahamas also have endemic species. Sometimes they're single island endemics and sometimes they're shared between a few islands, two or two or more islands. So it's really cool is we have endemic troguns, we have um, toadies, five species of toadies in three different islands. We've got a huge diversity of hummingbirds, endemic hummingbirds, eight different parrot species, um, hawks, woodpeckers, songbirds, and so much more. Um, but sadly, about 54 of these species are globally threatened with extinction. Hmm. And then what everybody else also needs to know and might not be appreciated is that the Caribbean is a very important wintering home for migratory land birds, also called neotropical migrants. And more than 120 species spend the winter in or migrate through the islands, including dozens of songbirds. So the region is a stronghold for several at-risk species like the Kirtland's warbler. It winters mainly in just a few islands in the Bahamas, and it's it's a threatened species. And um, also the Bicknell's thrush, which mainly whisper winters in Hispaniola, and it's another threatened species. So of course, we have to think about full life cycle conservation, right? If we're in North America doing what we can to protect the breeding grounds, it's also important to protect the wintering grounds because if the habitat's not there, for the birds to rest and feed um, during the winter and during migration, they're, they're not gonna survive. Birds are not gonna survive. And the Caribbean is also a very important wintering home for breeding and migratory, home for breeding and migratory shorebirds and water birds. So um, it's, a, it's an important wintering area for the near threatened piping plover. Have, has anybody ever seen a piping plover? I have Just, Okay. Um, and then it's also um, a few shorebirds breeding in the islands like the Wilson's plover and the snowy plover and kill deer and the American oyster catcher, which is here. 
So unfortunately, um, Caribbean birds face many threats. I would say the biggest, most serious threat is loss and degradation of habitat from development, um, especially mass tourism. So you've got hotels, golf courses, marinas, gated communities, um, ports, you name it. They're all being developed on valuable coastal property, which of course destroys mangroves and wetlands, which are so very important for ecosystem services. And then you also have deforestation, you've got oil spills, there's invasive predators, which prey on ground nesting birds and chicks. Um, there's plastic pollution, and then cats, feral cats, dogs, or, um, and other invasive mammals are a big problem for birds because they prey on them. And then there's climate change and national natural disasters. And I think that um, climate hurricanes have been increasing in frequency and severity due to climate change. We've had some massive hurricanes in the last few years that have done so much damage. And these have impacted many bird species. And this is probably not going to get any better. Mm. Um, we also have additional th threats and challenges. I would say in the Caribbean, like everywhere else in the world, really, there's there's a lack of appreciation and awareness about the importance and value of birds in nature. There's a lack of knowledge about the most important sites for birds throughout the islands. And then there's a lack of capacity, meaning like local people to study, monitor, educate, and conserve birds. So our organization is working to address these threats and challenges. And we do this through environmental education, conservation projects, science, and action and advocacy. And we try to take a really holistic and comprehensive approach because I think it's really needed. And our main strategy is to build local capacity to work and make progress in all these areas. So um, what we do, our, our kind of model is to develop regional conservation projects and activities and materials. And then we share them with all of our partners. And so we have outreach and education programs. We support science and on the ground conservation through grants. Um, we publish our own peer reviewed journal. So we give our local colleagues and partners a chance to publish their scientific research. Um, we do a lot of mentoring because oftentimes people don't have experience in publishing in a peer reviewed journal and they might get outright rejected from other you know, better known big journals, but we really mentor them through the process so that they can publish their work. We publish in three languages and our journal is open access. And then what we do is we provide a lot of training workshops for our different projects and programs. And we follow that up with grants, an opportunity to apply for a grant to implement what you learned. Mm -hmm. So we found like this is a really effective model for, for learning and then doing, um, you know, training workshops are great, but we found if we just did them, then people said, oh, I love that. It was great. I learned a lot, but then they don't have an opportunity to follow up with, with what they learned. So this has been a really good model for us. And then we also recognize the importance of sustainable livelihoods. And so we have a Caribbean birding trail project where we're training guides, bird guides, and trying to help our partners um, highlight um, the incredible opportunities for bird and nature tourism, which is really underappreciated in all the islands. So we're working to make bird conservation a positive, both culturally and economically, and then also develop a network of people that care about birds and nature and become involved in their conservation. So just quickly showing you a few of the materials that we've developed over the years. We do we publish these um, bird ID cards, which you know not everybody can afford or have access to a bird field guide. So these have like all the common birds on them. Um, every spring we celebrate the Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival, um, and this is our partners going out and taking people birding, having hosting events, games, you know, conservation actions like tree planting. And we provide a lot of materials like um, Endemic Bird of the Day. We have a whole campaign called Endemic Bird of the Day that we've been doing for the last three years. We're continuing it this year. We're featuring a different endemic bird and we provide coloring pages and activity sheets and, and so forth, all for free download on our website. And then in the fall, we celebrate World Migratory Bird Day. And that's a similar thing for a month. We um, help our partners with resources and materials and grant money to um, get people outside enjoying and learning about birds. And I don't know, are there any bird watchers on this group? Any birders? Um, I'm not an official bird watcher, but I like to go out in nature. And yeah. I observe them as well. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. There's a lot of people and there's lots of 
different kinds and levels of birds. I mean, a lot of people keep bird feeders and ju just enjoy birds in their backyard, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you can enjoy birds anytime, anywhere. And we're always amazed at what a good connection that it makes. It's like a springboard into getting more interested in, in the environment and nature. And, um, you know, once you establish that caring, then that can help lead to conservation actions. So um, we've had really good success with that. We've developed several different um, curricula to help teachers teach about science and nature. So we have this curriculum called Bird Sleuth, and we've shared it with um, and done training workshops. Another one called the Weston Whistling Duck Project that is a whole manual that teaches about wetlands conservation. And again, we hold two-day training workshops to show teachers how to use these. And then just quickly, these are some of our um, projects and programs. Caribbean Waterbird Census, Seabird Conservation, Caribbean Landbird Monitoring. Again, I mentioned before the Caribbean Birding Trail. So again, when I give a talk in the fall, I can share more about some of our work and, and progress to date. And I also want to let you guys know that we're having um, our next big international conference is this July, and it's going to be in Santa Domingo, Dominican Republic. And our theme is From Mangroves to Mountains, Saving Our Avian Treasures. So this is a fantastic five-day conference. It's a great place where everybody from all over the Caribbean and beyond comes together to share their work and um, talk about birds and make progress on bird conservation. There's training workshops, roundtable discussions, field trips. It's really, really exciting. So I encourage you to check that out and join us if you're interested. And then finally, just um, connect with us, like follow us on social media. We're really active on Instagram <clears throat> and Facebook and Twitter. We have a lot of resources on YouTube. Um, we invite you to sign up for our monthly newsletter. We send out every month about different projects of our partners and what's happening in the region. So yeah, that's it. Thanks thanks for the opportunity and, and for a few minutes of sharing about what we do. All right, this is beautiful. I mean, those pictures. So I really hope that uh, many of us looking at this last slide here, follow up, uh, if you'd, didn't get everything down, just go Birds Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Birds Birds Caribbean. Caribbean. Yep. Yep. And you'll find a lot of really cool information. I could entertain, we could entertain either one comment or question um, from anyone on could what I, could I speak, please? I didn't sure. can't find how to put my hands up. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I'm Patricia McGo from uh Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm also a member of um of Council of Presidents of the Environment. And we have two organizations that you may have heard of, which is the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club, and also the Point of Pure Wildfowl Trust. And both of them are, um, and so basically what I'm asking here is, have you been in touch with them or? Yes. Either? Yeah. Yes, I have. Okay. I'm well, well familiar with both of them and we do have colleagues and we, we network right. with them. Right, so, because yes. so what I what I wanted, I don't see any of them on the program today, but I wonder if I could make a special request to have a copy of of your uh, presentation so that I can share it with them. Would that be possible? Yeah, absolutely, not Thank a problem. You. And then I can because our present president actually is from Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club. Okay, and she's part of the birding group. Yes, with of them. course. So. This Wonderful. is why um, I think that's of particular interest. Thank you very much indeed. So I look forward to that. I can liaise through um, Dr. Murray. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So we want to move on. Thanks again, uh, Lisa. We want to move on right away to our next presenter. And let me just forward this here. So um, Aaliyah, you could go ahead and introduce our, our speaker for today. I keep going. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Aaliyah Paz. And from Trinidad and Tobago, I will be introducing Megan M. Hurting. And it's an honor to be introducing her. She, Megan M. Herting, is an associate professor in the development of population and public health sciences at the University of Southern California and director of the Herting Neuroimaging Laboratory. 
She received her PhD in behavioral neuroscience and conducts research in the emergent scientific field of environmental neuroscience. Dr. Herting also helps lead one of the research sites for the largest long-term study of brain development in the United States, known as the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development, also known as ABCD study. Dr. Herting's research interests involves understanding what environmental factors such as air pollution or one's access to resources in their neighborhood can influence how the brain develops from childhood to young adulthood. She studies these questions using maps of known exposures and linking them to brain imaging and behavioral tests collected from children and adolescents across the U.S. She hopes how we can inform both policy makers as well as in reducing harmful toxins, exposures, and environmental injustice across America. All right, thank you. I will stop sharing. <clears throat> that was wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Good morning. Um, I'm on the west. I'm on the west coast. So if you see me uh, drinking my coffee, because <laughs> I'm still waking up with you, um, I will go ahead and share my screen. I'm very excited to be here and uh, talk a little bit about what I do and answer questions. What time um, is it out there? It is six fifty-three a.m. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Um, all righty. So um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I will skip my name. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am and how I got into this research of behavioral neuroscience and environmental neuroscience. Talk a little bit about place and health and switch to what I do with air pollution as one environmental factor that I care uh, a lot about the last couple of years. Um, talk a little bit about how we study this in the ABCD study, and then some things that I think are important for us to consider for our own health and, and for making a better environment for, for kids for today and tomorrow. So who am I? Um, so you can see here a picture of my neuroimaging lab. We study brain health, we study individual differences, and we study environmental influences on those. Um, just interpersonally, I grew up, all these places on the bottom are places I've lived. Um, we moved around a lot as kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm also a first generation college student. Um, I became a behavioral neuroscientist in 2012. Uh, I defended my PhD. I'm now an associate professor. And I had to put that I'm a boss lady because lots of people say, well, what do you teach? And I do teach. I teach a course on environment and brain, but I mostly run a 14 person research lab to study these questions. So at the end of the day, I feel very much like uh, I have to be in charge, uh, which is good. I, <laughs> it's fun to be a boss lady. <laughs> so uh, this is a little bit about me and you can see my trajectory of some of the places I've lived. Um, and currently, right, I've been in L.A. for the last decade, in which I uh, did some of my training at the Children's Hospital, and now I'm at USC, but I'm still very much involved in the Children's Hospital here for my research. So, um, what do I study? I study brain plasticity, and I think for me, one powerful thing that came out in my training was that the brain was so malleable, right? So brain plasticity, meaning, right, that everything that we do and everything we experience can help shape the brain and how it may function today and tomorrow. Um, and so here on the left side is a kid going in an MRI. This is how we study it in, in my lab. Uh, it's non-invasive. We can put kids in there um, and look at size and structure of the brain and even function. Uh, here below is a picture of the brain. So this is the nose. You can see my pointer, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is the nose here, and this is the back of your brain. And you can just see here that there's a number of brain regions and they're labeled, but this gives you an idea of how we can take a picture and then think about uh, size and shapes of different various parts of the brain. 
So on the right-hand side is um, one of the more groundbreaking papers that have come out recently, which is mapping the brain, brain charts, if you will. Think about growth charts. So when you go to the doctors, kids will often be uh, measured for height and weight, and, and they'll, be, um, they'll be followed to see where they might be. Now, brain charts are good in theory. Uh, we're not there yet, but this is the closest that we've come. This is a brain chart of, of MRI phenotypes, if you will. And so you can see that there's different processes going on. We have late fetal life, neonatal life, infancy, childhood, late childhood, adolescence, and adult. Uh, and one of the things that we've learned over the last 30 years is the brain, you know, you the brain is still malleable all the way up until we we pass away, right? But it's especially um, malleable all the way up until early adulthood. So it used to be thought, oh, you know, childhood, the brain closes and, and it, it's kind of fixed, but that's not true. And in fact, it really does a lot of this, what we call peaking, which you can see here in the graph, uh, late childhood and adolescence, and even into young adulthood. So now uh, we think about age 24, 25 is when uh, the, the peak of the uh, maturational processes is kind of peaked its earliest plasticity. So all of these phenotypes, changes in brain structure, um, continue to develop. And I think that's really exciting because that means that uh, there's a lot of room for good, good opportunity, but also for vulnerability. So um, one thing that got me interested in this is brain plasticity. I was, uh, I was just a psychology student. I had never even thought about biology. I had never heard of the term neuroscience before I got to college. And so when I got there and they started talking about the biology of the brain, about cognitive processes, I got really excited about this plasticity, that everything could matter. And so one of the things that really caught my attention was how malleable the brain was. And I ended up in a research lab uh, not not knowing what I was doing, but glad to be there, in which they were also trying to understand this thing called experience-dependent plasticity, which is just the same thing. Experience matters. Um, and so in this, in this lab and many others, um, there was this idea that if you took animals like uh, rats and you put them in a standard cage with some friends and some food, their brains were very different than if you gave them lots of different experiences. And so in this case, and this was my job in undergrad, was to go in and every day switch out the rat cages with new toys. <laughs> I remember being like, I'm glad I'm, I'm getting paid for this because this seems kind of silly. But in the end, when you look at the brains of these mice and rats that had all these new experiences every day, their brain was actually different, not just in the size, but also the, the amount of complexity that the cells were making with other cells, their communication, just very, very, very different. Now, many decades later, we now think this is the normal. Every rat probably in the real environment experiencing things every new day, right? And so um, you could argue whatever you want to call this paradigm, but, but this was proof of principle that new experiences can change our brain. And that uh, we did some work to show that this experience exists all the way, you know, through adulthood, but you get bigger effects and more changes earlier on in life. So that then transitioned me in grad school to switch to thinking about uh, clinical work. So I, I did. I liked the, the theories that we were studying as neuroscientists in the animal models, but I really wanted to think about humans uh, and work with humans. And so I changed career paths in neuroscience to work with humans. And one of those things are still true, right? And so early life and plasticity of the brain is very true, even in early life. Here's a, a, another thing kind of similar to the brain charts, but these are a schematic of different systems in the brain that mature slightly different rates. So you uh, think about children in general, right? Some of the first things that babies do when they start to grow up is they start to see things and hear things. And so their sensory pathways, touching, feeling, all of those things kind of peak and prune, we call. So they actually establish their maturation the first thing, you know, that a baby's brain is going to do is going to start to absorb these experiences. Later on, uh, they start to hear words and they start to say words. And the peaking and pruning, the kind of plasticity for language is slightly later. Um, so this is why, uh, uh, much to my husband's demise and my two-year-old who can speak better Spanish, that I'm still working on my Spanish, right? So my language capacity is peaked and I still can learn language, but it's a lot harder later. And then there's the higher cognitive functions, right? These are things like emotional regulation 
and attention right now, uh, working memory, decision-making, planning, all of these things also occur. Um, and these occur a little bit later, almost like there's a, 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 pro, a building block, right? We first have to experience the world around us, then we have to communicate, and then we have to control and or integrate our um, emotional and cognitive systems. But they go through this peaking and pruning. And because they are sensitive at different time periods, the plasticity of different systems occur at different times in development, this might mean that experiences can have bigger effects on certain times than others. So this was kind of where it got into neuroscience. Very excited that the brain wasn't just going to come out and we were stuck and fixed um, with one set of brain right? We got one brain, but we can change it. Um, and and this was the st these were the things that got me very passionate and excited about neuroscience. However, one of the things I learned early on was what things influence these experiences. What does experience mean? So take a moment here. See if, if try this out for me. See if you can click on this and take this poll, which is what do you think is more important for your health? Do you think it's the genetic code or possibly your zip code? I'm gonna pull up my other screen now. Is it working or no, it's not working. I hope it's working. Can you put the poll up again? It's, yeah. It's working. It's working? Okay, yeah, I'll put the poll up Where again. Put it up again, yeah. Well, okay. Give everyone a moment. We only have three votes. Okay. <laughs> I think I put mine in. Okay. Yep. Um, they're slowly changing. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think is really fascinating beyond the brain, just in general health, right, is those that answered zip code is correct. That your health, uh, including your brain, can be more influenced by the places you live and where you live rather than your genetic code. Um, and so uh, switching back to my, my other lovely um, poll is um, every place uh, that you live and every experience matters. So um, this got me really interested because starting to think about the fact that where you live can be very different. And thinking about brain plasticity, what might that mean for kids' brain health? Ready? Mm -hmm. um, so then the next question becomes, uh, mm -hmm. what makes up a healthy environment? Oh, okay. Does it let you answer this one? Uh, okay. Uh, could you put it up again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, there we go. This is what I get for, ha um, I had a wonderful student who I'll thank at the end, helped me put this together. And I said, I don't know if I'm smart enough for this technology, but <laughs> so if you, supposedly, if you put this in, what makes up a healthy, a healthy place? Okay, clean, safe, clean air, clean water, green space, amenities. Ooh, clean media. I like that one. Nutrition, toys, infrastructure. Love, oh, I like that one. Love, that's true. Wonderful. So these are all uh, great answers. Um, you can keep answering them. It will still take answers. Um, and so um, this is true. So I was thinking about how the kids' brains were developing, right? This is what I had spent my my career and my training on. And then I started to realize because zip zip code mattered so much, what was it about zip code? You know, that's very, very, very arbitrary. And so I wanted to think a little bit more about what makes up 
a, a healthy environment and how that could influence kids' brains. And so um, during this time, and I'm sure many of you are, are, are aware of, of these of these things, you're the environmental experts, I'm just a brain person, uh, is thinking about uh, the natural environment, so air, climate, weather, green space, the social environment, um, you know, uh, networks of people and social interactions and policies, the built environment. So this includes our neighborhoods, um, laws and biases, urbanization, education, opportunity. And of course, you know, in America, uh, especially we have had laws and inequality of policy for a long time that's led to environmental injustice of what neighborhoods get access or what resources due to racism and other factors. Um, and so, um, and then of course, there's how you interact with the lifestyle within your environments. And then of course, there's your age, your sex, your genetics, and everything that makes you you. But these environmental factors all interact and they all have uh, quite a big role in, in health. Um, and well-being. And so this made me really think if the brain was so malleable, um, uh, why are we continuing to not think about all these things being those, you know, toys that we change every day for the rat? Why aren't we thinking about how all these bigger factors play into how kids' brains are developing and and and, and their possible policy and, and public health implications? And so um, perhaps you've seen some of this work, right, which is done by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others that have really shown that even things like life expectancy can vary. So in this case, this is two places in Connecticut and they're, um, they're not very far apart. And yet um, the living in one neighborhood is uh, attributed to 15 years shorter life expectancy than the other neighborhood. Um, and so this inequality of what is in the environment, what things people are exposed to or have access to are affecting people's health. And so, uh, you know, yeah. people have studied this in various other health outcomes, but wanting to think about what this means for brain and brain plasticity and really thinking about um, the uh, policy implications of things like rec residential segregation in America and a number of other factors, knowing that, you know, uh, the burden of, of unequal access to healthy places uh, and, and the inequality of that is, 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 is not one, in, uh, is not uh, uniform across the United States and for, for everyone. And so one of the things we can do to try to study this right is, um, is uh, ask people what their environment's like uh, and or use um, some uh, more uh, um, map quality information to learn about those zip codes. And so one of the things that uh, we decided to do because we were working with large cohorts of kids uh, was uh, try to understand the environments they live in through mapping uh, their home addresses and their school addresses to think about what do the neighborhoods they live in mean for them in America. And so one of the many things that we ha um, have access to and have mapped in our cohorts are things like this. And I take no credit for this, uh, except it's an amazing resource, is something called the Child Opportunity Index. Has anyone heard of this before? Hmm, I haven't. No. Okay. So this is a great resource in which people have mapped across the United States um, uh, differences in various um, environmental influences and opportunities. So for example, um, it, you can explore this map. Uh, I'll put the thing back up. So if you want to go and play and find yourself, you can uh, zoom into an area, say you live in Kentucky or you're from Kentucky. You can go in and see what are the factors that might influence your health by living in that area. So just an example, I'm going to take you to my neighborhood. Here we are in Los Angeles. I live in a Mexican-American neighborhood here in Los Angeles area. Um, and you can see that here, it's telling me that my opportunity index is very low, which is true. There's not a lot of resources in my neighborhood, not a lot of green trees, not a lot of access to clean, uh, to, to good food. Um, it's very much a very low income neighborhood. However, right, if I just go down the road, you can see here in this area of the neighborhood, uh, this is a, a, a more wealthy neighborhood uh, and it has more accesses. Its overall opportunity index is very high. You might be wondering, well, how did you create some summary score? And so this really neat map will also help you um, look at some of the things that go into this. So you can look at uh, population density, you can look at the chart of opportunity across the United States, and you can even see in any given track 
how they're coming up with some of these things from what is the educational index of early opportunity for education centers and high quality education in the neighborhood? What is school? What is the school poverty like? What is the health and environment to things like access to green space, access to healthy food? access to walkability. So these maps allow us to understand what the neighborhoods are and what kind of access to resources kids and their families might have in the United States, um, as well as learning a little bit about, you know, the inequality that definitely exists neighborhood to neighborhood in any given city, in any given state in the United States. So these maps then allow us to think about how to better understand the environment around kids in thinking about neighborhood. Taking you on this weird journey, I promise it'll all make sense in just a moment. <laughs> okay, so now we have that the brain is developing. We have that we have the opportunity to, no pun intended, think about the differences in neighborhood quality and the environment in which people live. And we can put this all together to say, how does this affect the developing brain? And so here, one thing that I really care about is when these exposures matter. So, you know, it's it's true that the brain is malleable and changing and early life to um, versus later life could have very different effects in what the environment means for the developing brain. So similar to earlier about being passionate about having kids have a healthy start as early as possible, the same is true. The environmental influence could be very different earlier on than later on. And what does this matter for brain health? And so we can often map things. Here's an example of three homes, home one, two, and three. We can map people and, and learn about the access to parks and the access to cl uh, clinical and, and resources. We can map them to air pollution. And here I have some, some smokestacks. Um, but we can also map people over time, right? So you may have moved across uh, uh, the city or the neighborhoods can change. And so we can really try to understand the timing of these various exposures on brain outcome. And so that's really what's passionate about our work is trying to understand how environments at a certain time and a certain point influence brain maturation. So this is a schematic of how I got here. Um, but now I wanna tell you a little bit about the science we're doing with air pollution. And the reason I got interested in air pollution, in addition to all the other environmental factors that we study, is because it's ubiquitous, right? Every day we breathe in air, and air quality is something that I think I took for granted um, uh, because I didn't really think about what's in air pollution, who, how does it affect us? And so it be, it's become something that I'm interested in as a physical stressor. So thinking about air, what are some causes of air pollution? And we're gonna go back to this um, poll. Um, what are some causes of air pollution? You you might all, you might for all I know, be the expert in air pollution. Mm hmm Traffic, correct. Burning. Cars, coals, airplanes. Exhaust, particles. Yeah, we'll talk about those in a minute. Smoke. Smog. Uh, PM 2.5, we got some sort of air pollution expert in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Gas appliances, uh-huh. Factories. The one I always blew my mind was the LA port here, the shipping ports. Hmm. Um, is that what I always thought it was because LA loves their car so much. Turns out a lot of our pollution is from the shipping ports because we're a huge port bringing in lots and lots and lots of uh, uh, shipping from overseas. We're one of the biggest ports in the U.S. Um, oh, wind, a wind blow. Okay, we do have an expert. Windblown dust, definitely. <laughs> um, I love this. Um, uh, VOCs. Okay, we have a lot of experts on the call. I love it. So, air pollution has a lot of, um, clearly a lot of different sources, and they're uh, ubiquitous in our environment. Um, and so 
it seems like you already know this, but I'll remind you in case um, it's not on the forefront of your thinking. So out of all the things that we think affect human health, we think it's small particle pollution, right? Uh, that we breathe that are harmful to our health. And so the smaller the particle, the more harmful it's thought to be. So um, as you mentioned, uh, some particles have a size of 10 micrometers, um, and these would be PM 2.5 and dust, the dust particles. They get can get smaller to PM 2.5, right, are those that are left than 2.5 micro, uh, micrometers. And, and these uh, um, are, uh, are thought to be the ones that at least we study primarily um, because they get further into our bodies. Uh, and this is just to give you an idea of how small we're talking, um, but it's made of mixtures, right? Mixtures of droplets and other things in the air. And some are from dirt or dust, uh, uh, smoke. Um, and so um, I think you're all air pollution experts, but this got me interested in this as physical stressors. And the sources, right, as you all mentioned, traffic, power, uh, wildfires, uh, uh, program burning of, of um, volcanoes, agriculture, dust storms. So air pollution is, is, is all around us and some are man-made. We could definitely make that better. And some are um, natural in terms of um, in terms of the being in the environment. Although with climate change, right, we have accelerated even the natural forces of air pollution. And thinking back about how does air pollution then get into our bodies and affect our brains um, and thinking about the developing brain specifically, the prenatal period, right, we know that the mom can inhale particles and this can influence their placenta. Some of the particles have now been uh, shown to pass the placenta, so possibly either ruining the, the actual oxygen uptake or getting into the, the fetal tissue itself. Postnatal, post, postnatally, when we're kids and adults, we inhale particles ourselves, and some of them have been thought to maybe go directly in our nose up to our brain, although this is still a controversial topic. We're still trying to understand that. Um, whereas the rest of them, right, can be taken deep into our lungs. And the smaller the particles, the further they get into our lungs, the more likely they are to transmit into the blood um, and circulate throughout the body to cause systemic effects of, of, of inflammation and oxidative stress. And then, of course, it can also influence uh, the blood-brain barrier. Uh, it can make it leaky and or some very small particles or certain types of metals in the air can make it into the brain. So uh, it is a physical stressor and it's got sources all around us. So how does it affect brain development? As I mentioned, the blood-brain barrier, right, which is going to protect our brains from uh, external substances, it can become leaky. And this wouldn't be problematic because not only could particles themselves get in the brain, but anything else we're trying to keep out of the brain can get in the brain. And so it could just harm the defense system. We also know that uh, gray matter, which are the tiny, uh, which is made up of neurons in the brain, um, can also be influenced by air pollution. So we'll talk in a minute some of the findings we've seen for differences in gray matter. But if you look at the animal models too, there's differences in the cell type, the cell number of brain cells uh, following air pollution exposure in animal models. Uh, white matter, which is made up of, if you have a neuron in the brain, these cells and their connections, you can have a fat called myelin and it helps for faster conducting. And these uh, white matter uh, bundles uh, are, are covered in something called myelin. And air pollution seems to be especially harmful for this process of, 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 of myelination. And if you get impairments in this, you can slow processing of information uh, and efficiency of your brain communication. So um, some of the existing work to date has been great. It suggests that brain can affect all sorts of, uh, air pollution can affect brain in children, uh, risk of ADHD, slower processing of information, it, higher risk of autism or depression and anxiety symptoms in kids and adults. There's a whole world out there. It's really exciting exciting uh, because they're starting to understand how air pollution might uh, relate to dementias uh, on the other end of the lifespan, risk for stroke and other stroke and, and then, and then yeah. in general, in we general, know that we air know pollution that also air causes, pollution causes, also causes their inflammation. Their inflammation. So, it, so it causes the uh, oh. Okay, I think it's better now. Some feedback. Yeah. And so the neuroinflammation can uh, be problematic. Yes, thank you. So, so these are the reasons that, that we want to study brain plasticity environment. The access to 
course, but also air pollution varies across um, across neighborhoods. If you have a highway next to you or you have a, a any of those sources that you guys mentioned, is to start to use the ABCD study. We have a couple of smaller studies of children participate. And this study started in 2016 was a big investment by federal funding to study how the brain develops in a, a large cohort of kids. And it's called the ABCD study. And that's where we're studying air pollution and environmental context. So you can see here some of the locations, 21 different study sites in which we recruited kids. And we recruited them when they were nine to 10 years old. And there's a, about 11,000 of them that enrolled, closer to almost to 12,000. And we've been following them now for we're in year seven to eight of, of this 10 year study. So we see the same participants and families over time. And we understand how their brain structure and function is changing their behavior, who's at, who's developing risk for substance use or anxiety and depression, and studying what's contributing to those risks. And of course, my role in all of this, and with uh, a number of uh, wonderful collaborators, is to think about the environment and how we can maybe think about what these are, uh, what uh, influences has on on kids' um, brain structure and function. Here's one of the maps that we use. Again, going back to plotting where people live and the differences to air pollution, uh, we're plotting what is the exposure to PM 2.5 in this case, sometimes NO2 or ozone, and and things in the mixtures uh, and how that might relate. And so I just wanted to give a highlight. I'm almost finished. I hope I'm not over time yet. Uh, of some of the uh, some of the things we're finding so far. So here we have a cohort of eleven thousand kids across the U.S. Um, and uh, it's a very diverse sample compared to anything we've studied before, right? Before in, 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 in medical, biomedical research, we've tended to exclude the most vulnerable. Um, and so here we're looking across the United States and we're seeing how does PM 2.5 uh, based on where they live is related to brain. And so this was one study we first put out to say that air pollution actually was related to differences in cortical thickness. So the size and shape of their gray matter volumes using MRI. And you can see here that in blue are regions in which higher air pollution related to smaller volumes or thickness in the area. And in red is um, uh, air, the opposite, a positive association. And this was kind of surprising. So everyone before this thought air pollution just equals decreases uh, in, uh, in brain volume. Uh, but if you remember the maps of brain charts, the brain goes through a growth and, and then it goes through a little bit of pruning. And so we think that there might be a difference in when timing of brains peak and prune for efficiency and neuroplasticity. And so this is the work we're following up with now. On the right-hand side here are white matter tracks in the brain. And so going back to those myelin, the content that surrounds the cells for faster communication, and we can study this with something called diffusion tensor imaging with MRI. It's a just a different way to take the picture. And this is a finding that we've shown that air pollution in this large cohort across the United States relates to decreases in kind of the microstructural tissue of that white matter in the tract shown here. The different colors are just different parts of the of different tracts that connect different regions, but it was a rather large influence and what was kind of surprising was there was a dose effect. So the effect of uh, air pollution on these white matter tracts and their health was not so robust at very low levels of air pollution, but you started to see once you got up to closer to the EPA levels of what was considered safe. Now, everything was below what's considered safe for EPA. And so this had us really concerned that even safe levels of air pollution might not be safe for the developing brain. Mm -hmm. And we'll get back to EPA in a moment. In addition, we have also used some uh, similar methods uh, trying to get at what could be uh, underlying tissue structure. So here's some examples of cell types uh, that you might see in the brain. And we can look at whether or not things like myelin or uh, support cells, which are called microglia and astrocyte cells, and whether or not their proportion might be different. Uh, these are all proxies, of course because we're in humans, so we're not going to look at physical cells, but we're going to get at whether or not these uh, properties exist in the tissue. And so we've been able to also look to see if whether or not the proportion of certain types of uh, microstructure tissue relates to air pollutants. And in this study uh, that came out last year, we looked at PM 2.5, but also ozone and NO2. And we found that there was again a difference in the in the tissue property. In this in this case, we're looking at gray matter. You can see here these three regions that popped up: the brain stem, uh, as well as the nucleus accumbens and the uh, putamen. And and what we found with this approach is that uh, not only these three regions had 
tissue differences, microstructure tissue, but also it was driven by PM 2.5 and not a combination of exposure to ozone and NO2 as well. So again, building off that uh, exposure might influence brain structure in today's kids across the United States. The last study that I'll talk about, and we have more studies coming out, but this study also came out recently in which we were studying brain activity. So one way we study this is we put kids in the MRI study and we look at correlations in um, fluctuations. So we can measure bold oxygen level dependent signal, which is a very fancy way of saying oxygen use. Your cells need oxygen to function. And so um, we can look at how much this oxygen use uh, correlates in one part of the brain versus the other. And so in this case, uh, you can see that we can measure the whole brain and see the correlations of their oxygen use over time. Things that are highly correlated, we say are functionally connected because they seem to be talking or sharing information with each other. And so we wanted to know whether or not air pollution in, uh, was associated with these differences that we regularly study in kids. And we did find that air pollution was uh, related to differences in these three networks shown here. So the default mode network is a network that you may have heard of, which is important for um, um, internal thoughts. So this a network of fluctuations in the brain is very active when you're mind wandering or when you're reflecting on something, when you're remembering something. So really internal thought. Then the frontal parietal network over here is really engaged when you are learning something new, when you're engaging with the world. So attention, working memory, social interactions. And we found that air pollution had differential associations with these patterns of brain activity. Now, what was more striking, right, was that it wasn't just when the kids were 9 to 10 when they first started the study, but it actually influenced how these developed over the two years that we then waited to scan them again. And so this was the first study to say that air pollution uh, in your neighborhood could influence how your brain is growing or changing um, over uh, over time. With um, So we're still trying to figure out what the consequences might be and or if there's cumulative effects or the brain is plastic, you know, perhaps if you um, are able to reduce air pollution, you can even uh, mitigate some of the differences we've seen here. But this was one of the more recent studies that looks like um, that air pollution's effects earlier could maybe persist uh, for years to come. And that was really alarming to us. Um, so, um, oops. So these are some of the findings to date. What can we do about it, right? Um, I always like to say in my lab, we want to change policy. But in the meantime, while we're working to po towards policy, what can we do um, for, for everyone? And, um, and, and so one of the things we do is we can sh share this information with others, right? Um, I didn't think about air pollution and what that might mean. Um, but we have some infographics if you scan this. And of course, I can share my slides from our center that includes, you know, what we do know about air pollution health um, in both English and Spanish. Uh, and we also uh, share things more regularly. So share this information to, with others is one way to make a difference. Um, inform people. Um, the other thing is, right, uh, and maybe you guys already know this because you're experts in air pollution, right, is being cognizant of air quality in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Anyone here have the Air Now app? Yeah, I think we do have it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, try to uh, make personal choices that might mitigate some of the longer term influences of the environment on our health. And then, you know, connect with organizations, right, um, to hopefully reduce some of this. Now, everything I talked about today <clears throat> was outdoor air pollution. So clearly, uh, you can also do things for indoor air pollution, such as filters and um, improving in air quality inside. Uh, but this is mostly talking about outdoor air pollution. Uh, and then lastly, you know, keep pushing for, for cleaner environments um, and putting between starting to put this talk together and, and presenting today, right, EPA, the ones that kind of decide what's safe, did come up with slightly um, better air pollution uh, standards. So we went from 12.5 microgram meter or 12 microgram meters to nine. That's a great that's a great start. The World Health Organization says we should be about five. Um, our work says that that's still, we still see differences over five. But, you know, trying to push for people to know about these things, that they affect their health, um, and, and really try to get the research. This is where my lab comes in. Try to provide the research so that when they look to say, what is the safe level? 
that they know that it might not be as safe as they think for mm -hmm. various health outcomes, not just the life expectancy or, or cardiometabolic function, which people have heard about the heart and the lung, but also the brain. And so how does that factor in for supporting and making sure that everybody's air uh, allows for optimal health across America? So that's what I, that's what I'm passionate about. And a special thanks to my whole team. Um, I have a very uh, wonderful group of people who work alongside me and Tiffany here who is uh, my EH Matters student. We have a program called EH Matters where environmental health policy uh, students get paired with us um, to work. She helped put this together, including the poll. So <laughs> you have to let me know if that was a success or not. Her great <laughs> idea on how to make uh, this more interactive, but a uh, special thanks to all of them because I'm just one person. It's really all these people that uh, make the difference in, in doing this work. So I hope I gave us enough time for questions and I didn't lose you in my informal presentation today. All right. Thank you so very much, Susan. Absolutely. That was phenomenal. You did not lose us. Um, <laughs> you kept our attention from the beginning to the end. It was fabulous. Thank you so much for such an informative presentation. I have a number of questions that I would like I know, to ask. Right? I know <laughs> that um, there are many in the room that would like to as well. Um, and so I will just ask a couple and um, please, if you have a question uh, for Dr. Hurtling, please, uh, for Dr. Hurtling, please go ahead and um, raise your hand and we would be happy to take that question. So um, I am so thrilled that Dr. Murray asked me to co-host um, <laughs> this particular topic because it's interesting to me for many reasons. Um, as a general pediatrician, of course, you're just speaking, yes. <laughs> speaking my language. And <laughs> then um, I we recently did a poll um, in our research shop here at the University of Michigan, um, looking at parental concerns about air quality and found that um, two out of three parents said that their children were exposed to poor air quality at some point in time in the last couple of years. And of those families, one out of five said that they thought that air quality affected their child's health. I think if, wow. they, saw this, if they saw this presentation, I think even more may realize that yeah. it's affecting their child's health in ways that they don't know. So um, it's so important, I think, to draw attention to this, this concern so that people can take action. I had um, a couple of questions. I work a lot with adolescents. And so I think that the age group you chose was like the right age group. But I wonder, <laughs> knowing that greater impact at younger ages, even though we have this plasticity throughout the lifespan, um, why uh, did we not start at a younger age for the ABCD study? Yeah, I love this question. So um I think so the air pollution work wasn't a, 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 a primary aim of ABCD. Uh, they wanted to start at nine and 10 because in general, uh, adolescence is a time of opportunity and vulnerability. And I think for feasibility, studying them for 24 years was a little hard. So there's a new study called the healthy brain. You you might be part of it. The healthy brain. Oh man, it's H HBCD. A child development study. And that actually starts with the pregnant mothers and it will fill the gap up. And so it came later. Um, but this one with the adolescents, I think is important for the, um, uh, oops, I, I clicked on the wrong thing, um, uh, is important because um, the, the peaking and pruning that happens is really unique, right? This is the time in which your brain continues to grow neurons, mature neurons, and then start to prune. And so this was a good opportunity to see at this time point before us, right? Before our lab started this work, there's many people doing this wonderful work. Um, they had really f focused on the prenatal period. So mm -hmm. mothers, what was the mother's air pollution exposure? And then they were measuring the kids, not with MRI, but with you know questionnaires at six and seven. And that works equally important. I think from a, because I was an adolescent brain development researcher, I thought, well, the brain isn't done. We, we The brain's not done prenatally. What about all this exposure now as kids are running outside and playing outside and, and, and their schools are being built next to freeways? What does that mean for those kids? And so I think we need both. I think we need to know early life as well as continual life exposure because it all probably matters, right? Earlier, the intervention, the better. But what does it mean if uh, we don't understand what it mean, uh, what is happening as we 
progress through the lifespan. So great question. Well, thank you. This, I, I agree that th this gap in adolescence, right? So um, my research focuses mainly on childhood excess weight and obesity. And there are studies looking at prenatal exposure and then later um, development of excess weight, but not so much um, in the adolescent years. So much left to learn there. Looks like we have a hand raised already. Um, Mary Alice? You, Good like morning, everyone. Thank Good you. Morning. Can you hear me? Yes, you, we are hearing you. Okay, quick question. Um, over the course of the last uh, five years, I've been in, uh, engaged with uh, development, a uh, possible development that, that's really catching flight now since uh, Justice 40 through the Brownfield is allowing funding for this old school that I went to kindergarten with that's been vacant for many years now. Uh, I'm hoping that I can stay in touch with you ladies uh, talking about this early child because it's Tri-County that's trying to purchase and redevelopment and, and reopen it so we can catch these babies early on would be wonderful if we had all of this information and, and things in place as this moves along. By the time they get to high school, they'll be healthier when it comes to eating and all that. Um, I, I'm, I, I, I'll let Laurel help me out with that as well as Dr. <laughs> Murray here. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. We'd love to make sure you have the resources and and uh in order to share that as as you battle that um that important topic. Thank you. It'll be coming up soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for raising that. And we need more people out there making a difference, particularly early on in, in children's lives. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. I oh that's Murray. Other questions, comments? I have a lot too, but I want to give people a chance. So, uh, um, I was oh, just wondering, um, what was the retention rate of your longitudinal study? Yes, great question. So, um, we have had pretty good um retention rate in terms of um they're still enrolled in the study. So, I think ninety six percent retention rate. But there are a lot of missed visits and a whole different topic could be for researchers who how how to have survived the pandemic, not only interpersonally, which is hard for so many of us, but also trying to keep a study alive. So we, we did do a good job of maintaining contact and um, uh, uh, even asking questions about that stress of being during the pandemic. But we have a lot of missed visits. So even though people are engaged and so answering questions at 96% retention rate, we do have a as the as the study progressed and through the pandemic years especially, we had a very uh, we had a drop off in participation in visits in terms of scanning their brain or taking cognitive tests. Uh, um, but um, now that the world feels a little more normal ish, uh, we have had more people come back in person and complete their visits. So 96% enrollment, they haven't quit the study, but uh, lo lots of anytime you study a lot of people long term, right, you have a lot of missing data for some people and others and a, a great scientific question on what to do with that. And 96%, uh, that was, that's that, phenomenal. Yeah. That's very good. But a follow-up, <clears throat> have you found that people move to another area where the environment might be different, the pollution might be different, and how does that fit into your study? Yeah, that's a great question. So wonderful question. So everything, and I should have uh, I should have highlighted this as a limitation so far. So everything we've been focusing on uh, because of the timing it takes to do this type of research has been on air quality at the kids' home over the year prior to their first study visit. And then we account for whether or not they moved in the longitudinal thing, in the longitudinal measure. So the one where I said two years later what the brain was looking like, we accounted for people who lived at the same the same home or if they moved. But our longer term goal in our research, we really want to understand all of their exposures and this like, question of who moves and what does that mean. And so we've been working for the last three years on what we call a cumulative lifespan. So we know where they lived when they were born. We know what they lived um, when they were one, two, three, and we've been assigning exposure based on those addresses and patterns over time because we're really interested going back to the question of why adolescents and not earlier can do some interesting things with saying, okay, we know what your brain looked like at nine to 10, but were there sensitive periods of air pollution, whether there was wildfires that year 
or perhaps more coal burning, or perhaps, you know, uh, you move to a cleaner environment. And so we want to explore that individual variability and the timing in which this might, uh, might influence what we're seeing now. Um, and so that is work we're really, really excited about, but I sadly don't have any results at the moment. But great question. Good. Thank you. So I know Princess Princella. Yeah, I, I made it. <laughs> okay, go ahead and ask your question. I absolutely love, love this um, series. Thank you, Dr. Murray. And thank you for every single team member you have on here and especially your guests. So I'm actually having this question more focused on asthma. We know that there's indoor air quality that we should be concerned about and all the triggers that that entails when it comes to indoor air quality. But outdoor air quality to me, should be something that we should be focused on. If you look at just what happened in our community in Benton Harbor, I would love to put our zip code. I wasn't able to put my zip code in earlier, 49022 in your zip code um, survey, but we had the Canadian wildfires that actually came into our community here in Michigan. And we have a program called A for Asthma. And our A for Asthma ambassadors went through a lot during that phase of wildfires. And it's my understanding that Michigan has now made wildfires one of a program within the state of Michigan. We think of California all the time and other places, but now the governor has actually implemented a wildfire program. And that, what just happened to us last summer with the Canadian wildfires, and you should see it, it was just smoky outside. It was dark outside. We felt it from Canada all the way here in Southwest Michigan. That's one thing that we've been facing with outdoor air quality that I believe is having an effect on our asthma, asthmatics. But also you're looking, this used to be our area known for manufacturing plants. Tens of thousands of people came here for all the factories we used to have back in the day. So that's another thing that we're dealing with. Um, the companies that are able to even, and this may not have anything to do with it, but companies who, that have been able to dump into our lakes and water and mm -hmm. how that has been something that our community is facing. You know, this, I just want to know if there was a link. Also in our community, we had an infrastructure crisis with um, lead in mm -hmm. our pipes. Mm -hmm. And again, that's lead in the pipes. But all of this, I'm saying all of this to say, 24.6% of Black adults in our community, 24.6% has been diagnosed with asthma in our community. So when you look at the known triggers that's out there, I don't know if we've thrown in the wildfires, you know, and those triggers and some of the other things, but how can the outdoor, I know I'm taking a long time in saying this because it's a big question that I think we need someone of your expertise or um, guidance to say, how does out, outdoor air quality currently where we are today have such an effect on 24% of black adults having asthma in our community? And we are, Unfortunately, maybe six young people are dying of asthma. Every every six months, a person is dying of asthma. A three-year-old two years ago, a 10-year-old just last school year, and that number is increasing when it comes to our young people that are facing asthma as well. So it's a long question, but we need your help. So oh, no, that's a great question. You know, um, there is a, a strong, strong body of literature on air pollution and lung function and asthma in children and adults. And one wonderful speaker, if she's available, and if not, I'm happy to share her information, is Rima Harbour here, who is at our institute and who has been studying this, but also trying to understand things like, in addition to the wildfires, things like just living in a pathway for airplanes. So are you in a, are you in on the pathway from where, you know, takeoff and landing happens and what air quality from that might mean for triggering asthma with, uh, you know, and so she's very much active in the uh, child development and, uh, and, air, and air quality with asthma. And there's a strong link, even, you know, uh, neuroscience is uh, at the beginning of how to understand how air pollution is affecting the brain and how these environmental inequalities are affecting brain development. This is in its infancy, but the air pollution and the asthma work has been well established. So I'd be I'd be happy to share those uh, resources with you and that knowledge so that uh, you can take that and strengthen your argument and your work uh, and your important work uh, in your in your community. Yeah. Wow, what a great question. That, yeah, definitely send that information to us, please. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. 
it really highlights the need for advocacy from all of us to be mm -hmm. able to make changes. We know these things cause problems for children and adults as they're in their health, and we all need to advocate for change. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Murray, do we have time for yeah, we more have questions? Yeah, we have more minutes. Okay. We have a couple a few more. Minutes. Okay. So, oh, um, Patricia, I see Patricia's hand is up. Just, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, many of these um, uh, problems with the air pollution that have been mentioned today can be solved in some ways. You can maybe try to find to stop wildfires, etc. But there's one that affects the Caribbean very much, and that is Sahara dust. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, I mean, there is tremendous, at the present moment, we're on kind of yellow to orange alert for Sahara dust in the air. And I know that I retire to an air conditioned room as the as the dust gets higher because it really badly affects me. And so this is something that I would if anybody has ever studied Sahara dust, I would really like to know what the chemical composition of that dust is. <laughs> Oh, fascinating. I don't know that answer, but I will see if I can find some answers for you. Thank you. Because, it, you know, I mean, this is something that obviously affects a considerable number of people throughout the West Indies, particularly. It comes straight across and it is not pleasant, put it that way. Thank you very much. But thank you for a very informative. This was really um, learned a lot. Yeah. Lots of food for thought. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for highlighting that. It's your zip code, right? It is your uh, region of the world that can really impact your health. And that question certainly highlights um, the need yeah. to think about this um, and how important it is. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because um, all these examples that you have shared with me today in your own communities are, are are the nuance that's important, right? Is that every zip code is different. It does affect our health, the inequality and or the special uh, situations such as the uh, the dust that you're experiencing uh, is important for your health, but it's different, it's different, right? We just heard about the other um, wildfires in, in Michigan. And so uh, mm -hmm. thinking about the the differences and how to help each community, um, at, including your advocacy, work through their pollution because it's not going to be a one size fits all, right? If like you said, if if you solve the wildfires, mitigate wildfires, we need that. We need that for a lot of people's health, but we also need these other things of what is you know uh, what are the sources of pollution in your neighborhood and your community, and what can be done so that those can be improved for everyone's health. And so I think it's really that's the the joy of it. The, this big study I'm part of was like it's not a one size fit one size fits all solution. It influences brain health, but why it does could be different by community. And so we really need community engagement and advocacy and knowledge so that everybody can uh, help improve the lives of of, of 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 those around them in their own uh, in their own part of, of 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 the world. So I think it's a great point you all made today. I have amen to that. Yeah, so just I before I hand back over to Dr. Murray, I'd just like yeah. to ask, um, you told us how you got to this point and then shared about the fabulous work you're doing now. And I just wondered, what for you is the next big step? Like if you could do the, the study that would be of most interest to you, what would that be as a next step? Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like... Um, the work that, uh, well, a couple of different things. One is the the lifespan, the question of what if you move? What if we clean up air? What if uh, what if we look at different time periods of, of someone's life? And that's really exciting, but we're doing that. I think the other thing was the wonderful example uh, about uh, all of the all of the things that kind of we ex we experienced together. So um, the example um, about you know lead in the water and wildfires in the air and and, and importantly in the chat in the chat was about chemicals of beauties and barber uh, uh, beauty salons and barbers. And so I think for me, in addition to air pollution being one harmful thing, is thinking about 
the kind of, they call it the exposome, right? All these things in our environment that might add on to being additive risks for people. So air pollution is going to trigger asthma, but is it worse for someone who has other exposures going on? And how can we better kind of come up with going back to your expertise, precision medicine, right? And so what are these unique combinations of things in our environment that we can can get improve to improve overall health? Because it's air pollution is one, but there's so many others, right? Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for such an informative uh, presentation and discussion. I'm going to hand back over to Dr. Murray because it looks like we're getting close to the hour. I know he had some questions and some things he'd like to do to wrap up, but I just want to again express my thanks. And yes, thank you for making the connection, Dr. Murray. I <laughs> hope okay. we, can, we can be in contact offline. I All hope right. so. All right. Sounds good. So I have a different, thank you, Susan. I have a different type of question. Um, you mentioned early on that you're a first generation college student. Yes. Could you say a little bit more about that? And what would you say to others who are in that sort of position? Sure. Yeah. Well, f first off, um, that's uh, always ask for help. <laughs> One thing I didn't know, and I still didn't really even appreciate till I was far along in my PhD, is that professors were just people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were on a pedestal, right, as is doctors and all sorts of other people. And so um, I felt like I had I couldn't just be like, I'm interested in this. I should go ask about it or I need help because I don't understand this. I should go ask about it. And so I encourage anyone who is maybe new to academia to realize that professors are just people and not just help if you're failing, but just, you know, mentorship. It's OK to say, you know, you might not get an email response and it's not on you. It's probably because they're busy. So don't ever take that as a rejection. Uh, but, you know, it's okay to ask for a cup of coffee with a professor and learn what they do. It's okay to ask if you if they don't have time, if you can meet with their graduate students and talk about things and get ideas. It's okay to ask someone to review your resume or your personal statement um, because you don't have any, you know, you don't have a, um, you don't necessarily have a built in uh, support network of people mm -hmm. who know how those things work. And so I always was afraid to ask for those things. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, I love it. I love doing those things. And so I guess just knowing that professors are people and that everybody, you know, taking taking the chance to ask for for some um, mentorship or ask for questions or ask for help is 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 just, you know, part of part of understanding what you don't know. So that's something I wish I could have taught myself 20 years ago. Right, because your social, the social circle, family, friends, and stuff matters. Because a lot of first generation student, college students, don't have that at home uh, among their friends. They don't have role models, and so yeah, that's um, that's good. That's good to hear from you. The other thing I wanted to make sort of like cheek and tongue is. I feel like I understand your um, charts and everything, but I feel like I'm peeking. Um, <laughs> I, I have a lot of gray hair, but I feel like I'm peeking. Is it possible that, do you feel you're peeking? Um, is it possible? Beyond? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, so... <laughs> This is the problem I kind of alluded to, to growth charts being a little problematic, which is okay. it's, it's an average, right? All yes. those growth charts, you know, thousands and thousands of people, same with growth charts for kids, yeah. we're an average and we're each so different. And so we know what on average is happening and we do know that the brain is more malleable earlier on, but I'm with you. I'm, 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 I'm almost 40 um, and I feel like I haven't peaked yet. So, <laughs> right, right. And I, so... <laughs> yeah, I think how you think about it matters because sometimes people get to a certain age and they kind of start to think it's all downhill. But if your thoughts, because your thoughts are, I'm assuming could also change your brain. Yep. Uh, if your thoughts are that I'm peaking, I want to do this. I want to experience new things. That would 
make things different for your brain and and so on yes and i think um the the peaking and pruning and the optimal plasticity is just that experiences can maybe have a little bit of a bigger effect earlier on but to your point the brain is malleable every day to every experience so while i care about adolescence um, the same people are studying what is going on in, you know, when you're, when you're older. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, the same is true. Experience mm -hmm. matters that the rats in the cage with toys were not babies. <laughs> they they were all ages. They included, you know, what was equivalent to, you know, uh, our, you know, our old, old age in humans. And, and the effect was still there. Experience matters. It, it, you might not get it, you know, as big as an impact, but it, you're still peaking, right? So the right. peaking and pruning biologically is is a kind of a a misnomer in that it it does it doesn't suggest that you can't peak and prune uh, later yeah. on. Yeah. And you do get new cells. So neurogenesis, That's you do true. get new cells That's your entire true. life. Yeah. So yeah. every experience matters. That's why um, when you when you asked me to do this, I got excited. Not only because <laughs> it's about the environment, which I I really care about. But you said it was, you know, it says it's personal and it That's is personal. Right. Right? It is personal. It is it's personal. personal. Yeah. So. All right. So we're going to wrap up. But before we do, Aaliyah, do you have any comments or questions? Because like it's, like we said, we have a neuro, a behavioral neuroscientist right here, you know, for you to make connections. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, we could connect you offline if you wish, but. Absolutely. We could have coffee virtually. I don't know if you drink oh, coffee. I would love that. I I need so much advice. <laughs> yes, please. Anyone on here, you're welcome to email me and try to make sure you get the resources you need for your community uh, advocacy and the projects you're passionate about. And if you're interested in neuroscience, I'm happy to make sure that you uh, can learn uh, and, and talk and think uh, alongside us. We'd love that. Good, That's great. Good. I really enjoyed your presentation today. It was it was very insightful and kept my attention. The poll was great. <laughs> All right. I'll tell Tiffany I only botched it a little bit. It threw me <laughs> off. I feel like I was like, I'm going somewhere, but this switching technology is not my strong suit. <laughs> You did thank you fine. all so much. You did fine. So we want to thank everyone for this being on here for this presentation. We want to thank um, Susan uh, as a co-host. Um, we want to thank Aaliyah and our other co-host. Thank uh, Lisa for our special feature with the birds. And we look forward to hearing a full-blown uh, presentation on that. And we definitely want to thank a lot our uh, speaker uh, today. Um, it was an excellent presentation. You got people fired up. <laughs> so you're probably going to be getting some emails and stuff um, out of this. So we want to thank you very much and continued success and impact for the work that you're doing. It's uh, necessary and essential work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. All right. See you guys next Friday. Thank you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much for your Thank you. Make sure we get the recording. Yes, you will.